Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have six points. The first point will be about directly versus indirectly caused harm, why both are the same, by all the last speaker's words about why we should kill people also apply to not letting die people. Secondly, we're going to talk about why we can make a moral calculus here, and why we can't absolve ourselves from making any moral calculus, and why because we always make moral calculus, we better make the right one rather than walking away from it. Thirdly, we're going to talk about the relevance of Carlos' analysis on states and international people, why we don't think it's based only about soldiers individually and people's concession of protection, but also people should assess whether they should object to serve to the military or not on the basis of the consequences of that position, among other things, which makes that very much relevant. Fourthly, we're going to talk about soldiers and morality. Fifthly, about the unseen rules we're going to bring to the service here, but the soft power military creates. And sixthly, about why the nations we attack kind of consented to be attacked in a, in a weird way. Okay, so firstly, directly and indirectly causing things. So at the point where the previous team stood up and said, look, all these bad things happen if we go and shoot people because we instrumentalize them, because we say their life is not worth anything, because we say to them, you know, we can kill you and we put ourselves above you. We think exactly that kind of analysis, so kind of stealing that, applies also to letting die people. At the point where you don't say Thomas has toddlers, you say, well, I don't value those toddlers. I, where you don't prevent that saving, you also say, my value on those toddlers is, I, I place on those, is less than the value I place on the man killing the toddlers. So you can't, so those things are equal in a sense. So at the point where we see that all the just wars, pretty much all the just wars Carlo talked to you about, they pretty much all involve people killing people and us wanting to prevent that. At the point where that is true, we think there is no more where you can say we do not create that kind of situation where you're instrumentalizing people, where you have to take people's life away, or we have to issue some kind of moral statement that says we do not think this person should live now or this person should die now. We think you can't do it. This goes to the second point where we say there is no absent moral agent. The, a consensus objection is also a statement. Suppose the cost of a war is going on and you have a choice between going into military service or not going into military service. If you don't do that, that isn't saying I am absorbing myself from making a decision on whether we think uh, Serbian soldiers or Albanian citizens are worth more or worth more or less. We think by consensually objecting, by not intervening, you are also making a choice. A yes, consensual sir. objection is also a choice. The choice to not intervene means you are choosing explicitly also to let the Serb soldiers live and the Albanian citizens die. And we also think because proportionately, this is what Carlo talked to you, in the just kind of wars we're talking about, usually that means lots and lots and lots more Albanian citizens were dying than the Serbian soldiers you would have to kill. We think that was a just war. And we think the calculus should go that way. And we don't think walking away from essentially objecting is absorbing yourself from making a moral decision. It doesn't work. Thirdly, on this kind of calculus, how you should make that. I've just told you a bit about how it works. So we think that any moral framework, whichever one you use, always the consequences matter. Always what matters is what happens as a result of your decision. Suppose you're a true like Unitarian consequentialist. At that point we say, if everyone would be doing this way, if, and my net contribution to the army would probably be a good fit, unless you're a really bad soldier, in which case, well, we're not talking about you anyway. Um, so we think at the point where you're consequentialist, we should well, probably sign up for the army if you're good at it. If, even if you're like a captain or whatever, we think if everyone would be doing this, we'd be pretty bad situation because we're kind of talking. Even then, we think that the world situation we're creating by this policy, by this moral statement, is relevant. And even if all you care about is your own situation, I point to the very last point I'm going to make in my speech, which is very interesting on how you consent to other people intervening in your state of affairs when things go wrong. Fourthly, soldiers can be moral. We think soldiers can be moral because. Um, we have all kinds of mechanisms to have that in place. We're not living in a time of Napoleon Bonaparte, where pretty much everyone, um, where pretty much everyone was like doing what the, what the officer told them without regard for their own safety, without regard for morality whatsoever. We think we do train soldiers to make moral decisions. And when officers tell them really, really bad things, we tell soldiers, okay, you can refuse orders in that case. Go. Okay. What right do you have to kill civilians to cause collateral damage when you cannot ever avoid that? 
So we cannot avoid collapse of damage either, right? But in making that model computers, in, in the kinds of just war when we say the collateral damage and the killing of soldiers, and even the killing of some civilians or collateral damage, in the just wars, that damage will generally be much less on a scale, much, much less than the benefits we're creating by preventing Albanians from being genocided, if that's a verb. So we think that we should, so in that calculus, yes, we can't prevent that. And yes, we may not have a true moral right to like kill the take better right now. <laughs> but on the other hand, Serbian soldiers don't have the right either. So you can't avoid a bad situation. Um, and we don't think the moral decision of killing a Serbian soldier has a different moral context than the moral decision to not intervene in a, in a genocide. We don't think that is a different kind of, no, I don't think this person has the right to life decision before. So why can soldiers be moral? For example, recently in the Afghan wars, um, there has been a court case in Holland where the, it was the case that the soldier refused orders because he thought the, the, the officers didn't have done the true due diligence on the kind of orders they issued. They brought, were brought to court by the state and said you should have followed those orders and they were acquitted because they used their own moral agency to assess whether the orders they were given were right or wrong and then decided to follow through or not. We think this shows that soldiers can be moral. And yes, they may be talking about a different kind of soldier about years ago, but we say we can have moral soldiers, we can have soldiers that have that kind of agency, and that's why, um, and that's why we think soldiers can be moral, and not this kind of institutionalized, dehumanized person that's just part of the machine. We just don't think soldiers operate even better. We think that soldiers are more moral agents, have more agency in the war than anyone else has. Why? Because you're directly involved in the situation. Because if you are on the ground, you have more agency in preventing a war. You have more choices. You have more choices than anyone sitting at home doing absolutely nothing. That is pacifism. The pacifism also entails giving away choices, and we think that's bad. On the kind of unseen wars that will bring the bring to service here, this is an extension of what Carla told you. We think lots of wars would be happening if there were no arms. Why? Because we think well, armies prevent states from attacking each other. Because we think at a point where you have an army, the state won't attack you because they don't want to die. We think if no one has an army, the kind of evil states that they say exist as well, and we agree with that, will still have an army. And we think they will be able to exponentially do more damage with those existing armies still. We think that's really bad. Finally, on the consent point, we think that this extends as well to be consenting to um, having other nations intervene into your affairs. Because at the point where your state is about to become the kind of state that has this kind of bad army that ignores conventions, we think it's good if other states would intervene. I would want other states to intervene in my state if my government was about to do genocide for my people. And that's why I consent to rules and international order of affairs that allows that to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to oppose.